The 25th Hour Radio Show. Hey everyone, this is Kevin Huntsperger filling in for Rob Fairless. I'm uh, the co-anchor on WSIL News 3 this morning and also uh, the host of my own podcast, My One Two Three Cents, a wrestling podcast. And today, uh, Rob has set up an interview with a wrestling legend. Ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, Lanny Poffo. Mr. Poffo, thank you so much for joining the 25th Hour Radio Show. I am the genius of a Glorian Reno, still living in the past. I do appreciate you uh, taking some time here to be a part of the show. And fans who are listening uh, here in Southern Illinois are uh, very familiar. I, I hear it all the time uh, asking about International Championship Wrestling, a promotion that ran in the, the late 70s and early 80s by your father, Angelo Poffo. Can you tell our fans uh, a little bit about the history of that company and, and uh, what you guys you kind of ran, uh, I guess, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Illinois area? Is that right? That's right, and that was before flying. We were just driving along, sometimes not getting a lot of sleep. We did it for years, and uh, I learned to sleep in very uncomfortable places. So it was like a tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And um, it was not my idea to start a company. In fact, I was doing quite well. I was going to go to Los Angeles, and I got a phone call. Come on, it's the family, we need you. So I came, and uh, I tried to make the best of it, and uh, I sure made a Do you remember Ted Hike? I do remember that name, yes. He's not around anymore, I bet. But he's the guy that, he was our connection for getting WSIL Channel 3 in uh, Harrisburg. Yes, yeah, we were located in Harrisburg at the time, and um, when people find out, people who were there... Uh, who are still here at the station now and find out that I am a wrestling fan, they often talk about the times, uh, in particular, when your brother Randy Savage would, would bring the tapes. Like He literally drove the tapes to Harrisburg to drop off at the station, and they were uh, kind of in awe of that and, and, and looking back and remembering that. Are there any particular memories of that time period that, uh, because were you already wrestling at that point, or you said, you know, that you were kind of called to help the family business, so to speak. Had you uh, had something out in L.A., were you going to be wrestling out there? Yeah, I'm, I've been wrestling since 1973, and uh, we're talking about 1978 is when it started. Um, so I was already well along into the career. And now, I still get offers to wrestle, but I don't take them because I have to uh, pull my trunks up to my boots. <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't think the fans deserve to see a guy that's almost 62 years old uh, trying to wrestle. In fact, uh, sometimes I'm such a poor that I've accepted bookings because it was a lot of money. And I had an urge to give a refund to all the fans that, you know, saw professional wrestling on the marquee and then paid to see it and got something less. Well, you obviously, you know, you just mentioned you've been uh, in, in the business for uh, 40 years or just over 40 years. How did you go from your time in uh International Championship Wrestling. I know, I believe there was a stint in Memphis as well before you got the call to go to the WWF um, and wrestle under the moniker Leaping Lanny Poffle. Were you already Leaping Lanny, or was that something they gave you when you arrived in in uh, Connecticut? I've been Leaping Lanny since 1973, and I stole the name from Leaping Larry Shane, which is, um, and he got killed in a car wreck, and he would have been one of the greatest of all time. But uh, I liked that nickname, and I used it, and I stayed Leaping Lanny until I became the genius. Now, I remember reading in the aftermags, and I, I can remember pictures. Was there a point where you wore a suit of armor as well? Yes. <laughs> it was a point there. But the armor got destroyed when I used it in too many bunkhouse battle royals. <laughs> and uh, after all that pounding it took, I just threw it away. Um, uh, it, it was not real armor. It was theatrical armor, the kind that if you wanted to see the Broadway musical Camelot, uh -huh. uh, that's that's what maybe uh, Sir Lancelot would be wearing. 
one of my favorite memories growing up with your time in WWF, because where I grew up, I was in uh, St. Louis, um, and we didn't get international championship wrestling there. So my first, uh, other than reading uh, about you in the magazines, was seeing you in the ring for uh, your time in the WWF. And the poetry, those were all original poems that you read before matches. Is that right? That's right. So did you have a passion for writing uh, along with, with the wrestling, or how did the poetry work its way into that? Because I don't think we've seen anything quite like that since or even before uh, before your time with uh, WWF. Well, just like when I bought the suit of armor, um, I was always looking for a way to give myself a gimmick that's never been done. And um, because I was so interested in writing poetry and things, when I first became a guest on TNT, have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Tuesday Night Titans. Um, I said, well, I'm going to be a guest on TNT. And then I said to myself, self, if I'm boring, they'll never ask me back. <laughs> so that's when I got out my suit of armor and I did a poem for Vince. to goes, look back through the annals of history and the Wrestling Hall of Fame. Men from all nations with courage to spare who struggled to carve out a name. Now compare these high standards of valor to those chivalrous knights of yore with bravery staunches their armor, their glory both legend and lore. My, med my medieval connection with wrestling relived that magnificent past. Though mindless skeptics may snicker and scoff, the winner is he who laughs last. Alive with the love of wrestling, I appear on TNT between Vince and awful Alfred the hottest show on TV. I'm not your average wrestler, but I wouldn't want to be. I never scream or kiss my arms. I'm happy just being me. I call myself Leaping Lanny. I validate what I say to every single wrestling fan who's watching USA. Yes, I believe in miracles. As God has blessed this great land, I believe the referee will soon be raising my hand. And then when we went to commercial black, Ben said, Lanny, that was great. From now on, you do a poem before every match. And I tried to be blasé about it, but inside I was going, yes! <laughs> and I was all excited. I said, wow, I get to do a poem before every match. And uh, that was, yes, they were all mine. The good ones, the bad ones, the lousy ones, everything was mine. I love it. And when I was in eighth grade uh, in English class, we had to do a, a poetry unit and uh, cite poems and, and put together a packet. And I remember pulling one of yours from WWF Magazine and, and citing you as, as one of my favorite poets. So uh, those memories are good. And it was a great marketing tool, too, because you would read them off of the Frisbees, I think, at one point, and you were throwing those out to the crowd as well. Well, um, you're an expert in wrestling. Have you ever heard of the fabulous kangaroos, Al Costello and Roy Hepperman? Uh, yes, I remember reading about them, yes. Okay, they used to throw cardboard boomerangs out. And the boomerangs would have pictures of uh, Roy Hepperman and Al Costello and their manager, Wild Red Berry. And the reason I remember is when they threw them out to the audience, um, all, the, all the kids would scamper for them, and two of the kids were Macho Man and me. <laughs> and, awesome. um, of course, you know, it was <laughs> he was the alpha male, so... If it came between us, he'd get it, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I remember how exciting it was to receive something like that when you're a fan from the audience. So when they gave me the poetry gimmick, I ordered a couple of thousand uh, poems on pieces of paper. I rolled them up as scrolls, threw them to the audience. But what happened was they're not aerodynamic enough. They don't travel. Yes. But And, and I'm thinking, well, Al Costello has traveled a lot because... You know, he threw the boomerang. Of course, it wasn't real boomerang. It was it was cardboard. Uh -huh. Now they carried they carried a real boomerang in the ring, which was um, from an aborigine in Australia. But those are expensive and they're dangerous. Sure. See, that was he would he would bring it to the ring as a prop. Okay, but then um, I was thinking, what can I throw to the audience that's going to travel? I can't use a scroll because it doesn't travel. I can't use a boomerang because I'm not from Australia. And then it hit me, a frisbee. So I bought 400, I bought 500 frisbees, um, from the, and I had a poem printed on them, a generic WWE poem that I wrote. 
And then uh, when I was almost out of Frisbee's, um, the marketing guy, I can't remember his name, um, he says, do you mind if we sell these at the arena? And I said, do I mind? I'm, I would love for you to do that. So from then on, I got three Frisbees, and then I would win, place, or show. After my match, I would go to the uh, where the venues where they were selling the Frisbees, mm-hmm. and, and I would sign them. And you know, be nice to people and everything. And they would, because of that, they would sell out every night. Sometimes five hundred frisbees or more. Wow! Uh, every night, and uh, we sold several hundred thousand frisbees. And then, when I became the genius, of course, they stopped selling them. And um, but that was uh, very successful marketing. And uh, I always remember Sam Walton. Sell for less and be nice to people. Well, you know, the Frisbees cost $3. I couldn't change the price. But being nice to people, I never found that to be really difficult because I do not look down on the people that look up to me. That's a great attitude to have. How did you go then from, how did the transition work going from uh, leaping Lanny Poffo, uh, you know, the, the guy everybody liked to cheer and root for, to becoming the genius, the smug, cocky bad guy, so to speak, and managing guys like Kurt Hennig, the uh, Mr. Perfect, of course, and then uh, later on the Beverly Brothers. Well, thank you. You called me smug and cocky, but you didn't say he's feminine. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I know you're just being polite now. Uh, I I certainly had no shame about. I, I believe in cheap heat. You know, <laughs> just any. Any, anything to get a reaction out of the audience, and I didn't care about a thing called dignity. So anyway, when they just, when Vince decided to go for it, they kept me off the TV for about, I don't know, six, seven weeks. And then I came up to uh, Stamford, Connecticut, and uh, to the studio, and I did six vignettes. Um, and then they played those vignettes, and... Um, in the meantime, I was growing my hair up, working on my walk, getting getting enough caps and gowns, you know, mm-hmm. getting all getting all set. And the vignettes went something like, um, "Behold, the world's smartest man, so handsome and so proud, the epitome of genius, amazingly endowed, a one-man wrestling renaissance. Just let your heart rejoice and bathe in all the luxury of my poetic voice." The best of my competitors are so inferior. I far all think their greatest thoughts with my posterior. And when the Ben's bell is sounded on a stunning victory, I'll view that messy spot where my opponent used to be. I remind the competition and every foreign fan, behold, the world's famous genius, the world's smartest man. Things like that, you know. Mm-hmm. So they played those. People got really... um Oh, sick of me. <laughs> I came out there and um, cleaned around and uh, was a bad guy. Now, was, was it ever discussed? Was there, was there a, a, a reason, a, a, a thought put into why there was never any acknowledgement uh, of the relationship, the, the fact that you and, and Randy Savage were indeed brothers uh, in your time in, in WWF, WWE? <clears throat> Nobody ever told me anything. I was just lucky to be there. And, you know, let's face it, I came in there with nothing. You know, just um, just barely above the guy that takes the jackets back. And then in 1989, I do a something with Hulk Hogan, and it's gone four months in main events. Yeah. So I've had, I've had 23 appearances in Madison Square Garden twice on the main event. So, um, you know, to be headlining Madison for a garden at all. It's a tre- tremendous thrill. And uh, the only time that they ever said that me and Randy were brothers was um, a year and a half ago at the uh, Hall of Fame when I, when I inducted my brother in the Hall of Fame. Did you see that? I did. I did. I, typically, I I've made it out to nine of the last eleven WrestleManias. I unfortunately uh, 
took last year off in 2015 and, and didn't make it, but I did watch it on the network. Was that, um, I know that there had been a lot of discussion leading up to to your brother going into the Hall of Fame, and, and it was a family decision. I know that you and your mother had discussed it in at, at great detail. Do you Have you been in talks with WWE since then? Do you ever see a day where you and your father, Angelo Pafo, will be inducted into the Hall of Fame as well? No, it's never going to happen. I'm just glad Randy got in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, I was in Dallas, and I wasn't even invited to the uh, Hall of Fame, and I was in town, because I was at the WrestleCon. Mm-hmm, sure. And, and, I mean, this was last year, and that's a year for, you know, I made the speech, you know, I did, and tried to make everybody happy, and then the next year comes, and, uh, you know, I'm not even in, I'm not even in the VIP section. No. Do they merchandise any of, of your likeness or characters? Or do you have a Legends contract with them, or is there any kind of relationship at all with WWE right now? Uh, four times a, a year I get a check from whatever marketing money they, they figure I deserve. Hmm. And no, I don't have a Legends contract. Is that something? I mean, they always say, never say never, and you know we saw uh, so many mended relationships through the years. Are you open to any kind of relationship with WWE at some point if they were to induct you and, and or your father? I wouldn't refuse anything. Mm-hmm. It's just that, you know, the supply and demand, and right now, the phone isn't ringing except for you. <laughs> you just call me. So how are you? You you had mentioned uh, Res- or WrestleCon, obviously. You you still make it around the country to uh, these other events and, and, and checking out and, and meeting with wrestling fans, I would imagine. Let's put it this way. I, for every five times I get invited, I accept one of the bookings. You know, because um, my mother is going to be 90 years old. I, I look after her. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't like to do too much traveling right now. I, I understand that. I understand that. Do you keep in touch with anyone from those, uh, those days, uh, whether it was... Uh, with international championship wrestling, uh, WWF. I know you briefly were with uh, World Championship Wrestling as well. Do you do you keep in touch with anyone still in the business? Uh, George Weinroth. He was my tag team partner in the ICW. Okay, okay. Did you do all of that in the the Lexington, Kentucky area, or did you guys travel a lot all, around a lot with ICW? Uh, we lived in Lexington and traveled around a lot. Um, we, I mean, we. There was no place we didn't go. West Virginia, Indiana, Illinois, uh, you know, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama. I mean, there was no no trip too close, no trip mm-hmm. too far. Yeah, that's a lot of time on the road, I would imagine, and, and probably uh, racked up plenty of miles doing that. How was it working? Because I know you said earlier that you had the opportunity to go to Los Angeles. You stuck around and, and stayed with the family. How was that working uh, with your brother and with your father and uh, and your sister in law. Well, like I said, it was the best and worst of times. You know, um, it was a lot harder than I wanted to work. You know, mm-hmm. and um, right now at the age of I'm almost sixty two, I'm devoting myself to the aristocratic pleasure of doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> All that hard work is behind me. Well, it's well deserved, uh, a well deserved break and, and doing nothing, as you say. Um, did your father ever? I know there was a, a brief time where we saw him on WCW TV. They worked an angle, um, I think it was a Hall of Fame type of event or something with, with WCW and Ric Flair. And of course, uh, your brother were involved in that. Did did was Angelo Poffo ever a part of whether behind the scenes or any kind of on camera role, role with WWF, whether it was with Vince Junior or with uh, uh, Vince's father? Um, he, he worked for Vince's father, uh, Vince McMahon Senior, um, in the early nineteen sixties. And I, I also, you know, I we talked about the genius and and you know the the Hulk Hogan match and from Saturday night's main event. One of the other big memories of mine of, of from from your career was also on a Saturday night's main event. It was that battle royal right before WrestleMania three and Andre the Giant headbutted you and and 
split you open, and it was the first time I'd seen anyone bleed like that on on WWF television, so to speak. Um, how were those times wrestling uh, guys like Andre the Giant? Were, were those? I would imagine being in the ring with someone of his size, just I can't imagine the magnitude of something like that, especially on national television for NBC. Well, they needed a favor, you know. Uh, they, um, they were going to bring Andre against Hulk Hogan, and Andre was, had been a baby face or a good guy for all those years. So they, they needed to get him some vicious heat. And um, so they... It chose me, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, everybody was real nice to me, um, before, <laughs> and then I felt like, um, I felt like a girl with a one night stand, you mm. know, the phone doesn't ring. Sure. You know, so anyway, they got what they wanted out of me and, uh, you know, it was fine. As we kind of start winding things down, what is, is you know, I know you're relaxing and, and taking a, a well-deserved break. D- do you have anything coming up, any projects you're working on, any anything that you want to let fans know, how they can t- reach out to you, find you on social media? Do you do any of the Facebook or Twitter or any of those kinds of things? Well, if you go on GeniusLannyPoffle.com, that's GeniusLannyPoffle.com. Okay, that's my website. Okay. And uh, um, I'm leaving uh, September 17th for San Jose, California to be at an autograph signing. And then I've got several bookings, you know, coming up. And uh, I can't remember any of them right now. Um, Elevator is not getting to the top anymore, I'm afraid. <laughs> Well, we will send fans to your website for sure. Uh, Mr. Poffo, it has been a pleasure. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to join the 25th Hour Radio Show, and uh, I certainly do appreciate you uh, taking some time out of your day. Well, I appreciate it, and uh, I hope uh, and I wish everybody bona fortuna, the best of uh, good fortune and good luck. All righty. Same to you, sir, and uh, we'll be in touch. We'll, we'll uh, chat again hopefully sometime in the near future. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you heard him, the genius Lanny Poffle, leaping Lanny Poffle from uh, international championship wrestling fame here in southern Illinois. Uh, For Rob Fairless on the 25th Hour Radio Show, this is Kevin Huntsberger. Thanks so much for tuning in. Radio Show.